All right. You just read an article. Price Waterhouse Cooper faces rare crisis in an air suit. What, when it talks about an air, what time frame are we looking at here? Seven years, I think it was. Seven years, but more specifically, let's go back and look to what time period is referenced. Not numerical, but what's the name we've given this time period? Recession. The Great Recession. This is following 2008, and the recession of 2008, and it's showing that how lawsuits are still continuing to emerge from that time period and out of that bad economic environment. What do we have going on here? You have auditors that are being held are saying they should have caught the fraud and they did not. And they're trying to say the auditor should have caught it, but they did not. Auditors should have noticed fraud that was going on. Who was committing the fraud? Taylor Beans, uh, chairman. Yeah. yeah. The, the company. Mortgage company, but who's affiliated with that mortgage company? Is that the Colonial Bank? Yes, who's Colonial Bank Corp? I said something about U.S. Bank earlier. I don't know if they're the same, though. Okay, so look over in the third column. Let me scroll down a little bit here. Okay, starting right here. According to authorities, Taylor Bean, a major customer of Colonial, had been overdrawing its Colonial account since 2002. So Taylor Bean was a mortgage company of Colonial Bancorp. Now think of your own banking relationship here. They were overdrawing that account. What was Bancorp doing to cover? They just hit it, like, <laughs> like fees. Yes, they created fake pools of mortgages. Okay, Taylor did this with their, like, in order to cover their overdrawment, they created fake pools of mortgages. mortgages and sold these, fake these transactions. Looks like they resold thousands of mortgages they had already sold to investors. Then, Taylor Bean files for bankruptcy. That same month, Colonial fails. And now you have one of the trustees for Taylor Bean bringing the auditing firm to trial. Now, who was Price Waterhouse the auditor for? What do you mean who was the auditor for? They, yeah, which party, Taylor Bean or Bancorp, which party were they working with? I think they were in a Bancorp. Pricewater Cooper was doing the auditor auditing for Taylor Bean. Pricewaterhouse Cooper was doing the auditing for Taylor Bean. Okay. You see the paragraph right under the gentleman's face for the outside auditor for Colonial's holding company, Colonial Bancorp. Correction there. So you are right, Angelique. They are the outside auditor for the Bancorp. Now look at this argument. Last two paragraphs. Last three paragraphs. Price Waterhouse argues that it was deceived and shouldn't have been expected to catch the Taylor Bean fraud when the bank regulators, nor Colonial or Taylor Bean, did itself. Right here we see a reference for both financial and managerial accounting. Price Waterhouse says that they shouldn't 
they would have been the ones auditing the financial accounting. The bank court, as a lender to Taylor Bean, they would have been studying the financial accounting rules. But then it says here, too, that Taylor Bean didn't catch it in itself, meaning other departments within the mortgage company failed to detect fraud being committed by the leader. There we have an example of managerial accounting controls. Now, under auditing rules, PricewaterhouseCooper adds, it isn't actually an auditor's job to find fraud. How's that statement make you feel? They should have caught it, yeah. but you don't know if they were trained to catch it or not because it's most of the time it's a different department. If there's a different department, they say they be in Price Waterhouse. Rules make clear that even a properly, second to last paragraph I read, even a properly designed and executed audit may not detect fraud, especially in instances where there is collusion. That's where people are collectively coming together and working to create fraud. Fabrication of documents, you're producing false documents, and the override of controls. Now we have that going on at Colonial Bank here. So Colonial was not in itself, that seems like they were aware of what was going on. It also says Pricewater Cooper failed to audit dollars of billions of dollars in transactions and failed to certify assets and relied on unsigned contracts. So they did have a failure in some of their auditing. An unsigned contract. So it's an auditor's job just to see if, if the company is following their own rules of how they account or is it or it would, it would determine on what you were auditing. Okay. If it's dealing with a public company, you would be charged with auditing the financial accounting records and making sure that accurate and complete documents are being produced and made public. Okay, if you remember, there was an act that was passed following the 2008 crisis called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And you might have heard this talked about in other classes. If not, just note that this act was passed by Congress as a way of tackling this very type of situation. This has to, during the 2008 crisis, we saw the failure of companies like Enron and WorldCom. And I'll never forget Enron being called, the Enron CEO and the CFO being called before our Senate and the CFO even saying it was below his job understanding to know that false documents were being produced. Because as the CFO, he didn't have a view of low enough down on the ladder to see some of these reports. And our Senate was wanting to hold these two individuals personally accountable. They were trying to argue it was beneath or below their job understanding and it was that of a corporation, they should not be held liable. Now the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was passed and what it says is that the CEO and the CFO both have to sign off on these documents. When they are produced and made public, they have to sign off on them. The auditing firm who comes in must also sign off on those. And these three parties, if it's proven later that falsifications were created, they can be held personally liable. We notice other parties in here have already reached settlements. It references companies that reached settlements and never went to court. But we see right here that this is, as of right now, appears to be headed for trial. Closing paragraph also shows that other parties may bring charges against Price Waterhouse Coopers, including the FDIC program. They have actually sued them. And look at the very last. 
pro horograph, okay, may be in the internal auditor. They're also being brought to suit. This is a lawsuit that will take some time to probably play out, but I expect that in business circles, this again will be fully tested. It's not just as clear as maybe like an Enron case of who was responsible. I remember in that case, the accounting firm got put out of business. And again, it was a lot wider ranging and had a lot more ramifications than what we see in this example. But still, the bank had $25 billion in assets. It's by, you know, by a banking term, it's not going to be a J.P. Morgan or a, a Bank of New York, but still a pretty good presence in the Montgomery area. And again, strong regional bank. I have no, fact, no doubt that stakeholders were adversely affected and people suffered losses as a result of these actions. Again, a good example of what we have with subject matter in, in the news. So be on the lookout for your own examples and try to bring something to class. I think this helps create a concrete picture or at least paint a more abstract picture in your head about some of these principles we're talking about. All right, we have some questions unanswered. Specifically asked by Taylor. Yes. I'm saying you had some questions here that we need to answer. Oh yeah, let me go back to it. Specifically, you ask them, one to Kimberly, one to myself, but I always go, when you ask me in class, I'm always going to bring them into class and I'm going to answer them in a public forum. Okay. So Taylor would like to know, by the way, Kimberly, great post, she says. Now, can you think of a company where you would like to see both accounting sides in it, both accounting sides again? referencing financial and managerial accounting. And can we think of an example of Panther UPS. a company? Taylor, do you want to elaborate on that question? Or did I do a good job of asking? Yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> All right, so what type of company would we expect to see both financial and managerial accounting procedures? As I said, UPS. UPS. Why UPS? Because you would, you would have to be able to manage logistics of everything that you're doing in-house, but then it also has people who are buying stock. So they would need to see the financials. Great example. I would think any type of publicly traded company, you would expect to see managerial accounting principles, hopefully in any size company and any company type, because hopefully the accounting for that entity is being managed. And then two, financial accounting. Again, that is done for outside sources. Those outside sources, an example would be shareholders, people in a possible pool that would be buying stock. I would also say a company that went to a bank for a loan, somebody who was looking to expand financing. That bank would be an example of someone who would rely on financial accounting ratios and principles in order to gauge the credit worthiness of that bank to see if they wanted to give them any money. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, moving right along. Taylor asks, is there a case when you can have a period cost and a product cost at the same time?
hey, I will ask you, what's the difference between a product cost and a period cost? Product cost is in the materials more so, and then the um, period cost is more like activities. All right, I think of product cost as your direct cost. Mm -hmm. Direct, just think of direct materials, direct labor as examples. Period costs are not gonna be tied to the manufacturing process, nor is it gonna be tied to any particular product, but it's gonna be more of the overhead. It can't be assigned to any product, so it's gonna be more of the overhead or a cost that's gonna affect more than one product. So again, it can't be narrowed down to just one. So what would be an example of a company that, or what would be the example of a case that would have both a product cost and a period cost? Um, you could do it like a automotive shop or performance shop where they order parts to work with in their service area, but they also may produce their own like materials or promo items. So they'd have to consider both the inventory they order and what they make there. Maybe promo items wasn't a good one, but maybe they make certain parts there, but have to order others. Okay, let's, let's try to give this a good example. You're in Wisconsin right now. If I say ride a hog, what do you think of? A bike? What kind of bike? A Harley. A Harley. What does <laughs> Harley Davidson do? What was the last one was that? What does Harley Davidson do? They make motorcycles. They manufacture motorcycles. As part of that manufacturing process, must they acquire a particular product in order to go into that motorcycle? To where those products that they were acquiring could specifically be tied to that motorcycle. Yeah. yeah. The steel, the rubber, the parts of the engine, the direct labor, those working along the assembly line who are putting that bike together and assembling it, a direct labor example. Now, when that bike comes out, what else does Harley manufacture? Well, I sure see a whole lot, I'm sure they don't manufacture it, but I sure see a whole lot of riding apparel, mm -hmm. safety apparel, side bags, side bags and all of the items that might not go specifically on that particular product, but it could go across any range of products. But also, who sits up there in the headquarters? Headboard? Yeah, CEO. Your CEO, your human resources, your other higher level management, mid-level managers, those individuals who are affecting all areas of operations within Harley Davidson. Those would be examples of period costs. So when I talk, when you look for an example of period costs, really look at the overhead. Look at the overhead cost, look at the cost that affect more than one department. Product costs, look for ones that can be traced back to one product. We get a thumbs up. Oh yes. <laughs> and when I say a hog, did you know that's their stock symbol? No. H O G. H O G. So if you're ever wondering what the stock's doing, you can find it by H O G. Okay, that's the only questions I make note of discussion boards that are needing answered. Is there anything else that you want to bring up? Nope. All right. Well. Are you going here? Yeah. Oh, cool.
with that said, let's log in to our discussion area for week six. And there you'll find the presentation. That's cool. Or what are we talking about tonight? Cost volume profit analysis. Cost volume. What's the abbreviation for that? CVP. CVP. And that's how you're going to see me reference this. If I can find my password real quick, I'll get us. I'm having a middle age. Brain freeze. All right, I know I'm putting in the right password. launch it from a different web browser. All right, I was using the wrong either. <laughs> I'm so used to just being my email address for everything that we have here, so my apologies there. Okay, again, you can find this presentation in your week six discussion area. When you hear the term CVP analysis, what comes to mind? A whole lot of nothing. A whole lot of what? Nothing. <laughs> well, let's use, let's not focus on the acronym. Let's look at the official name, cost volume analysis. So how much it costs for how many products that you're making? For the analysis of it? What it costs to manufacture something. Think of it, cost, what it costs, volume. 
What type of activity do we have generated? Let's assume that we're the manager of, let's create a fictitious company, and we're going to call this Let's see what we'll call this fictitious company. Can you see my erase board? Yep. yep. All right. All right, so now we're the manager of this fictitious company. Let's create an airline company and call it, uh, what's a good name for an airline, an airline, an airline. Crash Airlines. That's a terrible name. <laughs> it's a terrible name. That's better. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to give it a terrible business plan then. <laughs> All right, so here's your Crash Airline. This is going to be my best rendition of an airplane. He's making sound effects if you can't hear it. Oh, we can hear all of that. <laughs> well, there we go. We're flying through the sky. All right. Now, the board of directors comes to you and asks, what's it going to cost And it, if we run... 50, 100, 150 flights. So we'll give it some type of scenario to what's the cost associated with running this number of flights. And at that level, when can we expect to go into profitability? At what level of output do we expect to start earning a profit? How many seats have to be filled before? How many seats have to be filled before we start earning a profit? Okay, now I associate this to flights. I'm gonna say one thing that we do good, we'll assume that we build a plane up when we okay. take off. All right, so. I'm gonna draw a graph. Yeah. You said the level of productivity to get into profit, right? Is how you described it? The level of activity to get into a profit. And again, we are describing activity as ticket sales right now. So on my x-axis, we're going to call this activity. On the y-axis, Let's call this cost. Do you ever have trouble distinguishing between the X and Y axis? No. Just no. always remember Y is in the sky. Okay, so. Not if you crash airlines. Not if you crash airlines. <laughs> All right, so. Here we are. We're going to start here at zero, and we're going to start putting these planes up. So as our activity, let's call this line here revenue. Okay, so as our activity increases, we expect to start taking in revenue. Before we ever put a plane in the sky, what type of cost might we expect? Fuel. Fuel. Okay, but let's think of something else. Not even affecting the plane. The airline building? I like the runway. Building. Think of the company. What type of expense would fuel be? Oh, 
Would it be a product? Because, I mean, technically needed to get the airplane off the ground. Variable cost. It would be a variable cost. Okay. Let's look at some fixed costs. I'm setting the picture for what we're getting ready to go through. Variable cost. What makes them unique? What's a characteristic of a variable cost? They change. They change. change is based on what? Uncontrollable activity. Just drop the uncontrollable and just say it changes with activity. It changes with output. So my fixed cost, fuel, excuse me, my variable cost, fuel would be a variable cost. The more planes I put in the sky, the more I'm going to spend on fuel. So what would be an example of a fixed cost? Yep. Advertising. Advertising. Who pays, what, what's is your salary? If you're the CEO of this airline, is your salary fixed? Yes. Okay, so we're going to assume your own salary, that's fixed. The lease that you have on the hangars, that's probably fixed. We start revenue out at the zero point because we incur no revenue until we start flying. However, we know that we're going to start out with a certain level of fixed cost before we take in the first dollar of revenue. So I'm going to start cost higher up on the y-axis, and I might say that it's going to look like this. And I'm going to call this total cost. You sometimes see this referenced as mixed cost. Someone take a stab at what we call this point here. Break even. This becomes our break even point. If I'm operating in this area, what am I doing? Losing money. We're going to call this area a loss. What is this area up here? I've got a red marker here, so let's illustrate it in red. What is in the upper right quadrant? What's in this area? Gain. Profit. That's all your profit. We'll just call it a gain. We can see using this type of analysis at what activity or what output can I expect to turn a profit. By knowing my fixed and variable cost, I can calculate my break even point. I can calculate when do I expect to move into the profit area or the gain area. What is the 5100 market? Well, I could schedule it at okay. Okay. 50, okay. 100, 150. Okay. So by assigning these levels of activity, we would tell management it takes 100 ticket sales in order to reach the break-even point. And what happens if management comes back to you and says, that's unacceptable. We need to be reaching break even at an earlier point. What might you do? You have to try and figure out how to reduce your costs. You've got to figure out how you can move costs down here. Let's say we cut costs to this point we can, I'm going to assume this blue line runs parallel to this black line. It's going to have the same slope. 
a look at my break even point now. Break even would now be at 50. Any questions? Okay, I figured our file would have downloaded by now, but back to our example, crash airlines. Why did we raise and start cost higher up on the y-axis? Why did we? Yes. Let's recap what we've done. Oh, because that's where your costs are. Like that's how much it takes to run crash airlines. What kind of costs could we say are represented from our starting point up to this point? Oh. What type of cost? Variable. Fixed cost. Fixed cost. Good job. Fixed cost. And we see as activity increases, we see our line representing mixed cost is also increasing. This increase represented on this line, we could associate with variable cost. And of course, we see our break even. So, fixed cost. What we just identified was cost volume analysis. How much does income increase if we install a new machine? What changes in volume would increase changes in revenue? If we change our selling price, again, what might we? What type of changes might we expect? More importantly, what type of target in sales volume do we need to target in order to earn a profit? Okay, break even analysis can tell us that. But again, by looking up that upper right quadrant, we know that we're going to be earning a profit. All right, fixed costs are not related to activity. Variable costs, we're gonna see changes based on activity. And mixed cost, remember, is gonna be the combination of fixed and variable. All right, let's look at a stepwise cost. A stepwise cost is when we expect to see some type of pattern in cost. So notice on the green bar, if you follow that, see how that kind of looks like a staircase? Um, you're not sharing the screen? Well, the Indiana audience should have jumped all on that one then. <laughs> competition. Perfect.
<laughs> okay. Now, follow this green bar. See how it resembles a staircase? Yes. Okay, this would be a good example. You might associate this stepwise cost as salaries of production supervisors. Okay, within that range of volume from zero to, let's call it 700, does my cost change? Yes. No. No, from zero to 750, or let's just call it 700. From zero to 700, we see no change in cost. Cost is pegged at 40,000 within that range. Okay, again, let's use the example of a production supervisor. Up to 700 units of output, salary is going to remain unchanged. However, what happens if we expand operations and we expand output beyond that range? Once we move beyond 700, we step up. It's the name of stepwise. And again, we see a fixed pattern within that small relevant range. All right, in CVP analysis, a stepwise cost is usually treated as fixed or variable. It's going to assume that, in this case, the supervisor is going to use some form of judgment on how to change that. If it's a fixed cost, look at it. It's fixed up to that point. Again, using judgment, do I need to bring in extra help? Okay, if it's a variable cost, Are we going to have to be on this range? Are we going to have to bring in, are we going to have to acquire additional resources? Are we going to have to acquire certain products? We don't think of the manufacturer here. Are we going to have to acquire certain products in order to expand? If we do expand, and again, we're studying a fixed or a variable cost, I see within that range, I know when I'm going to step up and I observe no change. You could ask yourself, at 700, do I want to expand? And if the answer would be yes to expand at 700, if you reached and had the capacity to take this out to, what, 1,300, studying that particular cost by itself, it might make sense to go ahead and crank out volume to 1,300 because you're not going to see an increase in cost. All right, a curvilinear cost. What do we have here? We're going to see this represented by the light blue line. What do we observe? It changes as activity changes, going up as activity goes up. It changes as activity changes, but it, not at a constant rate. So I see it varying in the rate of change. Someone give me an example of what you think would be a curved linear cost. Nonlinear meaning non-constant? Non-linear. It's not linear because, again, it's not a straight line. We don't see a constant change. Okay, so what would be an example, do you think, of curve linear cost? Your materials that could go up and down as far as so do you think we're looking at fixed or variable cost here? Variable. Variable. Using this form of, let's go back to this, we're, let's focus on the salary. 
what type of salary might be associated here? Uh, like car sales, where you have to take in consideration commission. I'm going to argue probably not, and here's why. Let's assume I pay you commission of 5% on sales. More sales, you're going to earn more commission, but that would increase at a constant rate. Meaning at one car, you would have 5%. You'd have five dollars at two. You'd have ten at three. You'd have fifteen. So if I graph that, I would expect more of a linear relationship. How about just like overall sales of a business? Like if you have like a small business that let's say just started, so. You start from zero and then more customers come in and you slowly go up. Hopefully. Well, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to use the example of salaries here. I'm going to use the example of compensation on earnings in order to illustrate the differences here. Um, you could, if you took something in manufacturing with that needed a skilled, skilled trade set, you might pay one person with one skill more than you would pay some of your general laborers. All right, you're on the right line. Let's just look at people who are paid by the hour. Okay, people who are paid by the hour. If I start to increase activity, if I really boost up, I'm going to have to bring a lot more people, a lot more man hour in there. Okay, but if I do small changes, I'm not seeing such a large increase. If, if we're focusing on Harley Davidson and all of a sudden they want to increase production of the B Rock, one particular bike, okay, they're going to have to bring the direct labor in there who specialize on manufacturing the B Rock. Okay, so they would see a smaller rise there from just that one product line. If Harley Davidson decided that they wanted to crank out more output across all motorcycle lineups, you would see more of a steady and you'd see a sharper increase. All right, let's look at this. Determine whether the following is a fixed variable, mixed, stepwise, or curve linear cost with respect to product units. So again, respect to product units. Rubber used to manufacture tennis balls. I hear fixed here. Yes, that would be yeah. fixed. What drives the cost, though? Is my cost greater if I manufacture 1,000 or 2,000 tennis balls? Your cost is greater when you manufacture 2,000. Okay, so is this a fixed cost? No. No. Because it depends on how many tennis balls you're making. It's a variable cost. Depreciation, straight line method. If you're doing the straight line method, is it the same every time? So is it a fixed? It would be a fixed cost. Even at zero units were produced, the cost is still going to be whatever cost you're depreciating. So assume you're depreciating at a schedule of $2,000 per month. 
even at zero output, you're still going to have a $2,000 appreciation. Remember, fixed costs remain the same regardless. Electricity. It's a variable. Mixed? It would be a mixed cost. So Why is it mixed? Variable, you are correct. Okay, because even if you produce and don't consume any volume of electricity, your utility company is going to send you a bill. There's a fixed cost component in that bill. So electricity is fixed or mixed? Mixed. Okay, again, because even if you have no consumption, they're going to send you a bill. However, if you turn the lights on and run them 24-7, that's the variable component on it. It's going to have a fixed minimum and then a variable add-on. Supervisory salaries. Very variable all right I'm gonna give you a hint okay. let's look at some of our other choices that we've not used oh the stepwise costs it would be a stepwise so again look at it as output if we were going to produce in one shift 4,000 units of output I would only need one supervisor to come in and oversee that operation. If that's all I could do, if I increased output to include a second shift or I increased volume, I might require a new supervisor to come in. If 4,000 units is all that one supervisor can oversee and I expand beyond 4,000 units, I need to bring that second supervisor. Bringing in that second supervisor would indicate my step up. So I would be fixed from zero to 4,000. Again, going beyond that, I would need to require the new manager, new supervisor to come in. All right, salesperson's commission, 7% for up to 100,000 and then 10% after. Curve a linear. Tell me why you think it's a curved linear. You are correct. Because. And don't say it's the one we've not used yet. Well, that. But, <laughs> um, as the sales go up, the commission also goes up. Or the, yeah, the amount of sales, as that increases, the commission also increases. But if sales are at zero, sales commissions are at zero. And then as we move sales up toward 100,000, it's going to move at that rate of 7%. Once total, com once sales breach the 100,000 mark, it's going to start growing by 10%. So at that point, we would see it curve up. Ten percent. So we would see the total commission cost there is going to increase. Think of the slope of that line. It's going to gradually be humming up toward. The slope's going to be moving up at seven percent, and then ten percent beyond one hundred thousand. So I would start to curve up at that point and I would slowly, my slope would increase at that point. Here we go. 
So how do we measure cost behavior? We can use scatter diagrams, we can use what's called the high-low method, and we can use least squares. Has everyone observed a scatter diagram? Yes. Yeah. All right, so it's going to display cost in a graphical form. Remember, it's going to look at all the dots. Think of an example here. Let's see if we have one. Here we go. So here's an example of a scatter diagram. So here, cost and units are arranged in graphical form. We are going to plot the horizontal axis. This is where we have volume. And costs are plotted on the y-axis. Each individual point on a scatter diagram reflects the cost and number of units for that period. So each one of those dots is going to reflect the combination of cost and volume. So looking at our formula, using a scatter diagram, let's look at the change in volume at 40,000 units, it's telling us. We have a cost of 24,000. Now we're going to estimate here. In your homework, you're going to be given more smaller increments. So you won't have to go in and try to estimate that. but. So why do they choose that point? Is that just random? Yes, they're randomly showing you this. Okay. Okay, so 40,000, it's asking you what's the change? We look at a volume output of 40,000, cost are at 24,000. Now go back to the prior period. You would go back and look at the change from the prior period. So we're going to assume this is at 24,000. We're going to say what happens if we change it and compare it back to this area. So look, when you're using the scatter diagram, I'm going to make this simple. Whatever two time periods you are comparing to, let me get back there. I'll look. What's that area of 16,000 represent? Fixed cost. So if I'm using 40,000 units, and again, we're randomly choosing 40,000, but for illustration, if I'm using 40,000, what's my change in cost? So based on that volume output, I see an $8,000 change. What's the change in units? There is no change because you're wanting to do 40,000. Well, there's a change. I go from zero to 40,000. Well, my change is 40,000. So wait a minute, what points are you looking at here? Like, 
Okay, right here I've got an output, 40,000. Right, I see that. From zero to here is where I'm getting my 40,000. Right, and then you get to the next one. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, right. Okay. We're starting right here. This is where they're getting the 16,000. It's just a little bit above the $15,000 mark. I was looking at the points, not that's where, okay. I wonder where I was lost for a minute. <laughs> so here I can determine as output changes at this point, it's my cost is 20 cents per unit. More per unit. More per unit. Well, at this point, this is what I've got to earn more of, or I'm going to stay in this area over here. Remember, I want to get up into this area. So isn't it the same for the period prior? Like the, because wouldn't it be about 21,000 minus 16,000? No, if I come across right here. Like when you said we were look, for looking at March, the period prior, wouldn't we look at like 21,000 where the estimated line of cost behavior is at 25,000? I wish I could point to where I'm talking about. Can I wait? Oh, sorry. No, no way. Let me get back here. I don't, I don't know. I think so. Are you doing that? I don't want to move the mouse again. <laughs> like, if you see where the dot is labeled March and you drop down directly to the purple line for the estimated cost behavior, that's about 21,000. If you were going to compare it to that period, what we're looking at is what are we changing from zero to 40,000? What you're doing at the first point, let's look at the horizontal axis. All right, what are we measuring here? Units. From zero to 16,000, what area is going to be represented there? The cost of the unit. All right, so we've got to determine the slope of that line. Now I'm getting a little technical here, but computing the slope of that line is going to show me the variable cost. Right, but I was just trying to do the math. It would be the same cost per unit at 25,000 units, though, right? That's what I thought we were discussing. At 25,000 units, what are my costs? Your cost would be about 21,000 minus the 16,000 over 25,000. So it's 5,000 over 25,000 is still 0. 0.20 or 20 cents per unit, right? All right, if you put 21, you would have 5,000 divided by 25,000 25,000 that would come to 25 cents per unit wouldn't it oh you're right yes you're applying the same concept here though you're applying the same concept you're trying to change it to a prior period okay All right, the high low method. Okay, here we're going to use two levels of activity.
All right, step one, what's the lowest level of activity? None. <laughs> I mean, technically, she's not wrong. <laughs> lowest level of activity? Uh, August. 17,500. 17,500. 17, so February. Oh, that's 52. What's the highest level? Mm -hmm. August, uh, October. October. 67,500. So what's the change in activity? 50,000. What's the change in cost for those associated changes in activity? Right, 67,500, we incurred a cost 29,000 at our low level activity in February, 17,500 units. We ran a cost of 20,500. Okay, so here, change in cost divided by change in units. So applying this method, I get 17 cents per unit. And what's that 17 cents going to tell me? How much the average unit is? Well, what type of cost is represented in 17 cents? How much it costs to make that one unit? Well, is this a fixed or a variable cost? Fixed. Variable, variable. Variable. And how are we going to determine the fixed cost? Better yet, how are we going to determine total cost? The 17 cents is going to be represented by my variable cost. How are we getting fixed cost? Uh, we know the total cost is equal to 29,000. Let's pick it 67,500 units. Total cost is 29,000 equals fixed cost plus Variable cost of 17 cents multiplied by 67,500 units. We're going to do a very basic algebra problem here. We're solving for an unknown variable of fixed cost. Right, so once you figure out the variable cost plus or times the unit, that's the 11,475, and then you take 29,000 minus the 11,475. And that equals your fixed cost. Correct. Fixed cost plus variable cost are going to equal total yeah. cost. We calculate variable cost at 17 cents per unit if we're manufacturing 67,500 units. I know that my total variable cost is. 11,475. And if we take 29,000 and subtract out 11,475, you 
you get $17,525. That is your fixed cost. Well, why do I want to know? What does this tell me? I mean, I know it's telling me what the fixed cost is. That's what you just solved for. Right. How does that, re what, what is that? What information is like given to me? What am I going to use? Calculating total cost. You need to know, why do you need to calculate total cost? Go back to the diagram I drew up at the beginning. Okay. 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 That's going to tell us okay. from our activity level where our break even no. point is. All right, the last one the least squares. You likely might not see this term again unless you take statistics or economics. Least squares regression. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of this. Again, as you see, it's usually covered in more advanced courses. And again, you would most likely, if you were going to run least squares analysis or regression analysis, you would rely on some type of statistical software. All right, but the object, the determination of total fixed cost and variable unit cost. So we have the same objective. What it's going to show you the slide does not give an example. Are you still seeing my board or are you seeing the need to know? I'm seeing the need to know. All right. There we go. Now I can see your board. All right. So a quick overview. And I say very quick, I'm just going to illustrate regression. Let's see what we can get rid of. We're going to move and assume we can get rid of this slide. We're still going to keep crash airlines. And let's see if I've got it marker. I don't like to write in red, but it's going to show me on the board. By knowing the slope regression analysis is going to show you specifically the slope of your line. This is called a regression line. And it's going to show you in mathematical terms what is the slope of this. I would want to know this because if I have a linear line and I can calculate the slope, I can also calculate the beta. The beta is going to indicate my change. So I would be able to tell at any point along this axis, as a manager I would be able to know that if I increase my activity from 150 to 200 to all the way out to 1000, if I'm using a linear line, I'm going to know to infinity what my total cost would be. By knowing the slope, I know at what point to set it, and I know the slope to draw it. Assuming a linear line, I can tell out to infinity. This becomes a very, very useful tool project planning long-term, long-range plan. So um, the equation for a slope is y equals mx plus b, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So the m and the b would be the fixed cost and the variable unit cost? 
because you have your two points, but what would I be using for both of those to figure that out? I'll give you a good op option here. You're not going to use this on your homework. If you want me to go in, delve into a conversation right now, I'll derail and do a presentation on these squares. If I can do this in my sleep again as an economist. But I got to ask, after looking at all the formulas there, do you, does this suffice? I want you to just see the term and know what it is. That's why we only included one slide with it. Okay. If you desire to have a conversation on, so it's a good sign. I mean, I, I guess it's, yeah, I mean, it's good. you don't have to go into detail, though. I just want to know. I guess if we were given it, we could figure it out. If we knew the points and other information, we could just go from there. I did include some notes. Right here that you can reference on the least squares regression. And like I said, you would rely on some type of software package, probably at an entry level Microsoft Excel. I just noticed the book is going to use and give you an example of running Excel at the end of the chapter. All right, so what we have here is we would see some variance. When we apply each one of these methods, you're going to observe some variance in output. Um, can you share the screen if that's what you're referring to? Thank you for that reminder. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to keep studying crash airlines? I think I'm good. <laughs> Probably don't want to fly it. I don't know that I would fly anything called crash, but you see in the board now. So what I was saying is when we look at the comparison of methods, we see a different outcome for each report. We see a slight little variance. All right, just keep in mind that over the scatter diagram, the way we just did that by hand, we assume some form of estimation. All right, so unless you were running with what we just did, we use estimation. Now, if you were using, again, that software package, you're going to get some more reliable data. Using the high-low method, we use both extremes, the high extreme and the low extreme. In some cases, that might not make a good representation of overall activity. If my wide or, excuse me, if my high or low measurement was extreme, you know, think of something 10, 20, 30, 100. Okay. Most of my activity could be down in that 10, 20, 30 range, but I'm going to use output, I'm going to use a measurement of 100 in that example. Again, that I could have very little activity up to that point. 
Least squares, again, using the software or using the statistical package you most likely would be using, again, is going to give you an exact method. All right, now I can tell you and point out the most important lesson is everything that we looked at here, we are using as a tool of looking at future activity. So there's always going to be some form of estimation involved here. What's the only true, when it comes to measurement of cost, what is the only true and accurate where can we only get the most true and accurate data from? You mean like waiting until it happens? It's from the past. From the past. Okay. Correct. Until you actually incur those costs, that's the only way you're really going to know what they are. All right, I'm going to look at a couple quick formulas here and then we'll break. We'll come back and we'll do some work on the board. Okay, one thing, contribution margin per unit. We're going to define this as the selling price per unit minus total variable cost per unit. Contribution margin ratio. We are going to divide contribution margin per unit by selling price per unit. So before I can calculate my ratio, what must I solve for first? You need to find the contribution margin per unit. You would have to find the contribution per unit. All right. Computing the break even point. Divide fixed cost by contribution margin per unit. Remember, at the break even point, what's my profit? That or anything greater. Excuse me? Is that what you're meaning? There is no profit at the break even. At that okay. point, there is neither profit nor loss. Okay. Okay, so referencing the textbook, again, here's Appendix 18A. If you want to dive deeper into regression analysis, this is going to show you how to use Excel to solve. Wisconsin, Kimberly asked a question during the break. How would one go about deciding which method to use? Would you choose regression? Would you use the high-low method? I think it just depends on what answer you're looking for. I mean, not to like skew the numbers, but if you want something that's more accurate, then I would use the uh, regression. And then if you're okay with sort of an estimate and like a ballpark figure, then you can use the high or low method or the, um, the scatter. Yeah, I think you would want to determine where you have the most reliable data. Mm -hmm. I think if I was using computers or I was using software in order to give me accurate data, I would lean more toward linear. I think it would probably be a, I mean, and I'm speaking now, again, I'm coming from an 
economic background. I don't think that I would use, what, what would make me not want to use the high-low method? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, why wouldn't I? Why might I choose to avoid it? I feel like it's the most inaccurate because you're, you're just, it's just extremes. If you were selling like a seasonal product, it really wouldn't give you as much data to like. And Julie, that's a great example. Both of you give good examples, but Taylor says it's because of the extremes you give a specific example of what might cause one of those extremes. So good job. Seasonal products could be one that would skew the results. Okay, so let me ask you a question. What cost remains constant over a limited range of output activity? Outside of which it changes by a lump sum amount then remains constant over another limited range of output activity. Are you, are you reading okay, that? So, yeah, where are you reading this from? I'm asking you the question right now. Asking, okay. Okay, so the first question was again. Okay, what cost remains constant over a limited range that outside of that range it increases by a lump sum and then remains constant again for another limited range? It would be a fixed cost, correct? A stepwise cost. A stepwise cost. Or a stepwise, okay. Let's see what you get. Okay, okay. All right. And what cost gradually changes in a nonlinear manner? in response to changes in volume. Nonlinear. It's the curve. Curve linear. Discussion question number five. How do stepwise cost and curve linear costs differ? Remember, stepwise costs remain fixed for a relevant period. They then step up and remain constant for another relevant range. Curve a linear, non-linear range. All right, to help this sink in, question number six. Somebody try to describe the contribution margin ratio in a lay person's terms. Selling price per item minus the var variable cost. All right, let me help you. Contribution margin ratio means that for each sales dollar, a specified percentage is available to cover fixed costs and contribute to profits. For a specific for each sales dollar, it's going to tell you what amount of that dollar is available to cover fixed costs. All right, let's assume that a company has a 75% contribution margin ratio. That's going to tell you that 75 cents of each sales dollar is available to cover fixed costs and contribute to profits. The other 25 cents is going to be consumed by the variable cost. So that ratio tells you, it backs out variable cost and it tells you what amount of each dollar is available to cover fixed cost. And once you if anything's left after you cover fixed costs, remember that's what's going to be applied to profit.
All right, graph number one, fixed or variable. Mm -hmm. Fixed, mixed, mixed. Mm -hmm. Fixed or variable? Fixed. It's variable. <laughs> Look at graph one. Look how when volume increases, what happens to cost? It goes up. It goes up. Therefore, it's very good. That's number two. That's fixed. That is fixed. What is graph number three? Mixed. Mixed. Notice the cost higher up on the y-axis. That is going to be your fixed cost component. Now, as volume increases, what happens to cost? It increases. It increases. There is your variable component. Graph number four. That's the curve of linear. Yeah. Curve linear and number six. That's stepwise. Your stepwise. Good job. Okay, let's look at exercise. Let's see if we can apply exercise number 11. This is going to pertain to income. You're going to have some homework relating to break even analysis. So let me write down what we know. Blanchard Company manufactures a single product that sells for $180. So sales price is equal to 180. And Total variable costs are 135 per unit. Company's annual fixed costs are 562,500. And it asks us to prepare a contribution margin income statement for Blanchard Company showing sales, variable costs, fixed costs at the break even point. Number two, if the company's fixed costs increase by 135,000, what amount of sales? in dollars are required to break even. Okay, so let's look at trying to see. I'm going to go ahead and give you in the prior problem 1810 you would have calculated that the break even point in units is 12,500. I was afraid we would be referenced there. OK, 
Okay, so here are the variables that I know. Selling price is $180. The total variable cost, $135. Total fixed, $135 per unit. Total fixed cost, $562,500. And our break even units I gave you is 12,500 units. And we're asked to prepare the contribution margin and income statement based off the contribution margin. What's the first line that appears on your income statement? Sales. Sales. What are my sales equal to? Um, is it the selling point? Yeah. What are sales equal to? Um, Multiply here. 12,500, we know this is your break even. If I sell those 12,500, I'm going to sell those at $180 per unit. So what are my sales? Two million two hundred fifty thousand. Two million two hundred and fifty thousand. What do I need to back out or subtract from these sales? Your variable cost. What are my variable costs equal to? Hundred thirty five per unit. What am I going to multiply by one hundred and thirty five? Twelve thousand five hundred, which is one million six hundred eighty seven thousand five hundred. One million six eighty seven five hundred. Five hundred. Of the note subtraction in parentheses. This tells me what my contribution margin is. So, what is my contribution margin? Five hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred. Five hundred and sixty two thousand five hundred. What can I do with that amount? What cost must I cover still? Your fixed cost. Your fixed cost. Remember the contribution margin tells you what amount you have available to cover fixed costs and contribute to profit. What are my fixed costs? This last island, I'm going to call net income. What's my net income? Zero. <laughs> Zero dollars. Did I earn a profit? No. No. No, I did not. My shareholders going to be happy? No. But you didn't lose. 
What's the goal of ever every corporation? What's the goal of every company? Maximize profits. To maximize profit. It's just the bright side. <laughs> without a profit, remember, without a profit, I can't invest in any type of future growth initiative. I can't invest, I can't acquire, I can't uh, expand. I probably can't pay you a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> no dividends, and just think if you were the investor who put up the money, you just loaned that corporation, you loaned them money, but got nothing in return. Okay, let's look at... Eighteen twelve. Now Blanchard manufactures a single product that sells for one hundred and eighty. So again, selling price. Is one eighty. Total variable cost, we said using these same numbers. Total variable cost is what, 135? Yeah. Annual fixed cost. Five sixty-two five hundred. Per year. Just know I'm right, I've got my back turned to the board as I write these numbers on. So if you'll call them off to me, we'll move faster. Oh sure. All right, so company's fixed costs are 562500 and we target an annual pre-tax income of $1 million. So we've got a goal. Pre-tax income equal to one million twelve thousand five hundred. Assume that fixed costs remain at 562,000. First thing we're asked to do is compute unit sales to earn the target income. So again, we've got to solve for units and the dollar. So, what are unit sales to earn the target income? And what's our dollar sales to earn the target income? So here we are. Selling price 180 total. I have these backwards. Total variable cost. $135 per unit, total fixed cost, $562,500. We have a goal of earning a pre-tax income of $1,012,500. How many units are we going to have to sell in order to achieve this goal? And how can we represent that in dollar sales? So we have to add our goal to the fixed income. Correct, we have to add those together. So unit sales at target income. What's the first cost we must cover? Fixed. All right, so we're gonna say fixed cost Above and beyond fixed costs, what are we trying to accomplish? Our pre-tax income goal. Okay, so target 
target income divided by 180. Well, look at it as the contribution margin per unit. So we're going to take total fixed cost, 562,500. What's my target income? And what's the contribution margin? It's 180 minus 135. What'd you say? It's 180 minus 135, the selling price minus the TVC. You're right. Oh. Selling price minus the total variable cost. Or excuse me, the variable cost per unit. So 180 subtract 135 gives me I got one million five hundred seventy-five thousand. Nine hundred forty-five equals thirty-five thousand per unit. That's what I got. What's five hundred sixty-two thousand plus? One million twelve thousand five hundred divided by forty five. Thirty five thousand. Thirty five thousand. Yep. I'm going to have to sell thirty five thousand units to achieve my goal. Units. Uh, how's that can be represented in dollar volume? Remember, same formula, fixed cost plus what? Target income. Mm -hmm. Divided by the CM. By the contribution margin ratio. We just defined 562,000. I can write over the same lines. That's my total fixed cost. Target income, 1,000. Well, 1, 12,500. So how am I going to get this ratio? Divided by 135 instead of 180. What's that give me? Um, Let's see. 11,666. Now just remember when you ask when someone asks you for a ratio, what is a ratio? Oh, it's a percentage. It's a percentage. It's going to show the relationship 
to 100, 100 being the whole number. You did this to Great. Uh, the variable is the number of units sold with the new price. Okay, so then this is one point three five divided by seven point one eighty. It's one point nine four percent. Or do you round? One one point nine four. Remember I can't be higher than one. So you just like cut off the rest or you just put it at 1%? Mm -hmm. What was the percentage you gave? I did 35,000 divided by 180 and I got 194.44 repeating. So then you move the decimal over twice to get 1.94%. Wait, the CM ratio is the contribution margin per unit that's 35. Okay, so to get the contribution margin per contribution margin ratio, mm -hmm. we're going to take the total fixed cost. I'm getting lost at getting the ratio. That's what we're trying to figure out. You're trying to figure out what's the ratio. It's the contribution margin per unit divided by the selling price. So 35,000 divided by 180. And what are you getting? Oh, 1.94%. The contribution said you can't be over one. Well, I'm, let me put my decimals in there. It has to be less than 100%. Because remember, you're trying to use it. Kimberly, what do you say? I am 0.25. Where did you get 0.25? The, the, the 45 divided by the 180 contribution margin of $45. 45 divided, divided by 180? 180, which is 0.25. Where did you get the 45 from? That was the contribution margin of 180 minus 135. Uh, prior example. Messed that up. Sorry, guys. I got lost also. Yep. <laughs> okay. So that comes to 25%. So what must be my target income in order to give me a pre-tax income of $1,012,500? Pre-tax income one million five hundred seventy-five thousand. Now, and I have a pre-tax income goal of one million twelve thousand five hundred. How much total income? What's my target income got to be in order to give me that goal? So take five hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred plus one million twelve thousand five hundred divided by the contribution margin twenty-five percent. Six million three hundred thousand. Six million three hundred thousand. Um, I must have a target income of six point three million. So it'll be the TFC. In order to give me a pre tax income of a million twelve thousand five hundred. Mm -hmm. 
Can you, because you guys know what? Can you send that? Makes sense. 